This is White Coat Investor Podcast number 119, Paying for College with Robert Farrington. This episode is sponsored by Set for Life Insurance. Set for Life Insurance was founded by President Jamie K. Fleischner, CLU, CHFC, LUTCF, in 1993, which he started while attending Washington University in St. Louis. They specialize in individual term life, disability, and long-term care insurance. They work on the client's behalf to shop around to find the most suitable products at the most cost-effective rate. For more information, visit setforlifeinsurance.com. All right, if you haven't checked out our new financial advisor page, our recommended financial advisor page, I recommend you go check that out. You can find it at whitecoatinvestor.com slash financial dash advisors. This page is something that I have been working on for years. Even from the very beginning of this blog, I have been getting questions from people basically asking for recommendations for financial advisors. And so in the beginning, I just threw a few names up there of people I knew were good, and that's kind of how it started. And then I had people start approaching me to be listed on that page. You know, I ended up turning lots of them down, obviously, because I think most financial advisors really aren't very good. And then eventually, it just became so much work, we started charging for it. I said, I'm doing too much analyzing all these different firms and trying to figure out who are the good ones to be giving it away for free. So we started actually, it was one of our ads that you could buy. You could buy a listing on the page, so long as you passed my criteria. And so I put a application in place, basically asked all the questions that I think you ought to ask a financial advisor when you hire them. And if they could get all the questions right, you know, that they were fee only, they were fiduciaries, their price was reasonable, they were giving good advice, they were using passive investments, et cetera, then I, I was okay with them being listed on that page. Well, that page grew and grew and grew and grew until we had over 40 advisors listed on there and it just became very unwieldy for anybody to sort through. So this summer, we redesigned the page in order to make it much more useful to you. And so we've got some premium listings at the top that include all kinds of information about the advisors. And then each advisor actually has their own individual little page on the White Coat Investor website where you can get even more information about them. But we've added clips from podcasts if they were on there. And we've also added a video that you can actually get a sense of who they are and what their personality is like and who their ideal client is like and learn more there. So we've tried to turn this into a, a very useful page for those of you who are interested in hiring a financial advisor, uh, whether you want to do it temporarily or whether you want to do it long term, whether you just need a, to put together a written financial plan or whether you want someone to manage your assets going forward. We've got a list of these top financial advisors from across the country. They will all work with you in any location. Chances of you being in their location are not high, obviously, because these are firms all over the country. But if you're in a big metropolitan area, there's a good chance that at least one of these advisors you could meet with locally if that was important to you. But for the most part, they work with people via Skype and email and phone, and which is really all you need when it comes to a financial advisor. You don't really need someone you can sit down with face-to-face. -face. So check out that list. That's at whitecoatinvestor.com slash financial dash advisors. Also, we're halfway through August here. And you know what that means? That means we are closing the submissions for the White Coat Investor Scholarship at the end of this month. You have until August 31st at midnight mountain time to get your application in if you want to get the White Coat Investor Scholarship. Now, we've had hundreds of people apply, and we still could use a few more judges. So if you're interested in being a judge, email us at scholarship at whitecoatinvestor.com. That's the same place you send your application if you want to apply for the scholarship. We're giving away over $90,000 in cash and prizes this year. It's a great thing that not only helps improve financial literacy because we're also giving a copy of one of our White Coat Investor books to every member of the winning people's class. And the top five winners, everybody in their class gets a copy of a White Coat Investor book. And so it's really helping to spread financial literacy throughout our medical and dental schools and, and other financial professions. But it also directly reduces the indebtedness of the top five winners. They're going to get a check for cash that will help them to not have to borrow so much money for their education. And so we're proud of being able to pay it forward, pay our success forward in that way. But be sure to check that out. We're not the only ones that contribute to it, though. We have uh, a lot of sponsors you've been seeing on the blog lately and hearing about on the podcast. Our five platinum level sponsors include Alexis Scalati that does strategic tax planning. Ben Utley, he's a financial advisor at Physician Family Financial Advisors. Splash Financial, which does student loan refinancing. 
Bob Bayani at DrDisabilityQuotes.com, who does disability and life insurance, and Larry Keller at Physician Financial Services, who also does disability and life insurance. So thank you for supporting those who support what we're trying to accomplish here at the White Coat Investor. We have a special guest here today. Let's bring them on to the call, and then I'll introduce them. All right, our guest today is Robert Farrington. He's an online entrepreneur, the founder of The College Investor. He calls himself America's millennial money expert. I first met him at FinCon in 2013, which is about the time I was getting pretty serious about the White Coat Investor as a business. The other person I met at that conference was Mr. Money Mustache. And the three of our blogs have kind of grown up together over the last few years. The College Investor started in 2009. Mr. Money Mustache started in April 2011. And I started in May 2011. I think my blog is the smallest of the three in terms of traffic. But I think I interact in more ways than either of the other people do. So maybe that makes up for a little bit of it. Welcome to the show, Robert. Hey, thanks so much for having me. You were actually the first... FinConner, I should say, that I ever met in the lobby of uh, FinCon in 2013. I still remember that because you're like, you had an investor in your name and I had an investor in my name and it was like, oh, what do you do? I, it's, that's still so funny that that was when we first met. Yeah, I remember that conversation because I was like, so are, is this investing for college? And I think your response to me was, no, it's for people in college that are investing. And I said, okay, well, that's interesting. It seems uh, a little bit hard to invest while you're in college. I know I didn't do any in college because I didn't have any money. I was too busy donating plasma for food money at the time. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just always was passionate about it. And I, I, I don't know why I thought that people would want to know what, you know, some 19, 20 year old kid had on, uh, you know, what his thoughts were on investing. But hey, like, you know, I wanted to share my thoughts. And, uh, you know, here we are today, 10 years later, right? <laughs> yeah. So how old are you now? I am 34 right now. 34 years old. Okay. Yeah. So you're the college investor. What did you study in college? I actually went into college because I was going to be a computer science major, right? And uh, my freshman year, I was in the basement of a computer lab programming and I hated it. I just, I couldn't stand it. I actually really liked the science and the logic behind it, but I just could not stand programming. So I ended up switching my major to political science and economics. And that's uh, what I ended up doing after uh, my first, uh, my, after my freshman year. <laughs> Now, as I read your bio on your site, thecollegeinvestor.com, it sounds like you were an entrepreneur from a young age. Are you honestly surprised to see what you're doing now with your life? I am. You know, I, I was definitely always had that like, you know, side hustling, how to earn money mentality since I was a little kid. I was, you know, selling candy bars in middle school that I would, my mom would take me to Costco and I'd resell. I was selling stuff on eBay through college that I'd go to garage sales and pick up. But, you know, my parents were also, you know, my dad was in the military and then he was in the defense contracting world for 20 years. And my mom uh, worked in public service for her whole entire career of like 40 years. So they all had these stable jobs. I really never expected myself to start a business and then actually do the business full time. I, you know, after I graduated college, I was working at Target and I actually did that. And that was like my career. I was a store manager there. I really loved it. I, I never expected it to be here, honestly. So that's what you were doing when you started the college investor. You were you were managing a, a target. Yeah, I mean, I was at the bottom of the the ladder back then. But yeah, I mean, I started you know working in high school and college, you know, cashiering and working on the sales floor. And then after college, I became an assistant manager. And a couple of years after that, I became a store manager for Target. And uh, I really enjoyed it. It actually. You know, it was fun with the people I worked with and I felt the job was pretty easy. And I think people are surprised to hear that, you know, target store managers get paid very well. So it, it was great. And it, it also gave me the flexibility to do side hustles and, uh, you know, build up my side business, which honestly, when I started, I never expected it to be where it was today. So when when did the side business become the main business? Well, it became the it earned more than my main, you know, my my career path uh, about two years before I left. So this would have been about four or five years ago at this point in time. It was a, a fantastic side hustle, right? Like, you know, the more it earned and I was at Target, it was like the, you know, it's almost like the movie Office Space. It's like the less I kind of like was stressed about my day job. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it finally got to a point where it was like, why am I still doing this? Because the only drawback with retail is uh, it's nights and weekends and holidays, right? So the busiest time of the year is Christmas. So, time. Sounds like an emergency department. It does sound like an emergency <laughs> department, right? So like, you know, you still had to why it's like I have young kids like, 
you know, even though the money's really good and I found the job to be easy, like, why am I still putting my family through this? My son has just started playing, you know, soccer and it's like, you know, I, I have to miss like half of his games because I'd be working on the weekend. And, you know, it, it really wasn't serving any purpose other than, you know, extra cash at that point in time. So it was tough to leave. But, you know, I finally just had to make that choice of, you know, what my priorities were of my life. And, and that's really where we are at today. Well, let's talk about the college investor. What's what's the mission of the college investor and has that changed over the years? Yeah. So today I am all about helping young adults and really anyone get a student loan debt to start investing and building wealth. And I really kind of champion my own path of doing it through side hustles. So I'm a big believer in the earn more mentality. I think that, you know, we are blessed at this day and age that you have like limitless money making opportunities. And so while you still need to budget and be mindful of your spending, I think if you develop a side hustle, you earn more, you can achieve your financial goals of getting out of debt and investing early, you can achieve that much sooner. And then plus student loan debt is complicated and confusing. And so I really just enjoy helping people navigate that process because, you know, it's hard. You're kind of like fighting the government effectively and, you know, it could be a challenge. So this has been a little bit of a, an interesting development in the physician financial space over the last Oh, I'd say two or three years. I mean, my WCI network partner, Passive Income MD, is always talking about side hustles and these other things. There's a Physician Side Gigs Facebook group that has 36,000 members in it, you know, and I look at it and I go, these are doctors, right? They're making 150, 200, 300, $400,000 a year. Do they need a side hustle? Well, I mean, it's, it's never a need, right? It, it's also like... I don't know. I kind of started, I always enjoyed my side hustle is because it's like, what's my hobby, right? And my hobby is kind of earning money. And so back when I was in college, like I would go to garage sales and I would flip things on eBay. I'd buy them and I'd resell them on eBay because I enjoyed it. Like I don't find like any enjoyment in watching television. I don't necessarily find enjoyment in doing, you know, other things that people might consider to be their hobby. Like my hobby really is making money and earning money. And so if I was going to spend my time doing something like I'd like it to, you know, generate some kind of income or have a return. And I clearly, I don't think I'm the only one in this. I mean, there's definitely people that need a side hustle to, you know, provide for themselves or change their financial situation. But I think, you know, especially, you know, when you look at like a doctor side hustle group, I bet you there are just, you know, people out there and physicians out there that enjoy the idea of entrepreneurship without the risk per se, or they, you know, just enjoy that kind of thinking skills or those activities. Now, your website, the blog itself, it seems to have a big focus on millennials. What's so special about millennials? Why millennials? Well, you know, I... It is millennials, but you know, it's everybody. You get found in search just like you, like, you know, people are Googling topics and they'll, on my blog will come up, but you know, I, you know, marketing 101, I had to like pick something. Right. And the one thing I always thought about with millennials is just like the baby boomers, the baby boomers are always going to be called baby boomers from the, you know, the, from the seventies and eighties, they were called the baby boomers to today. They're called the baby boomers. And, you know, I kind of view the same thing with millennials is they've been coined millennials and they're going to be called millennials till they die. And so it's like, as long as I want to do this, millennials will be around. And I just felt like that was a, a choice, but on the flip side, like, the blog and the personal finance topics are open to anyone. I mean, the math is the math and the tools are the tools. And so I do have a much broader audience. I'd say millennials actually only make up about 40% of everyone that visits our website. But on the flip side, it's, it's just a branding thing that I picked because, uh, you know, I didn't necessarily know what I was going to morph into five years ago when we were setting all this up. <laughs> <laughs> so do you consider yourself a millennial? I'm an older millennial, yes. <laughs> So how, how old are the youngest millennials these days? The youngest millennials now are like 22, 23. They're all wrapping up college, getting into the workforce. And the oldest ones are in their mid thirties like I am. So it's, you know, it's basically mid twenties to mid thirties is the uh, millennial generation these days. So they, they're still getting lots of flack. A lot of them get really personal about it. People are calling them lazy or overly lifestyle focused. Do you think that's valid or not? I don't. I think it's just... It's a different day and age, right? So when I look at when I look at every generation, shoot, there's plenty of boomers out there that have no savings, still have student loan debt, and are lazy. Like there are plenty of after every generation, Gen Xers, you know, all of them that 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 have these terms. It's just you know we're in a different time and a different space, and so like 
my parents have don't understand how I provide for a living on the internet. And so like, you know, millennials just have different tools, different avenues to earn. They have different, you know, viewpoints on life, but they're definitely not lazy or lifestyle focused. There's plenty of that in every generation. And I think that's just a very much an overgeneralization of the millennial generation. You know, it's interesting. You parents have no idea what you're doing either. That's basically the line my dad told me when I talked to him about a buyout offer I had a couple of years ago. He's like, I don't really understand what you're doing. <laughs> you know, it, it, It's such a unique, you know, the internet we all knew in the 90s was going to change things, but we had no idea how it could change our lives personally, I think, going forward. I had no idea in college that, you know, I would be making most of my money online, basically. Absolutely. And I think that's just that's the interesting aspect of the world we live in today. And I think millennials and then the next generations like the Gen Z or Zennials or whatever they're calling themselves, you know, one thing that they have going for us and we have going for us is that we have adopted the Internet and embraced it and we communicate and leverage it in ways that other generations haven't. And so when they say, you know, millennials can't communicate, I would challenge that millennials actually are the most communicative generation that has ever existed in the history of our planet. The problem is they're communicating on text and on Snapchat and online in different ways. And what they have lost and this is where I think the criticism comes from is they've lost the ability to verbally communicate in a face to face conversation. Now, that's becoming rarer and rarer. It's not to say they don't communicate, but some of the social norms and social skills that previous generations have built themselves on, the millennials are changing or having different norms of what that looks like. And that can be challenging to understand. Yeah, I think that's probably where a lot of that criticism comes from is, is, is just different. It's just different. And, you know, the next generation is going to be different. And, you know, in 40 years, you and I are going to be looking at these young kids these days. Like, I can't believe they're so lazy and what, but they're just different. <laughs> like, yeah. So what's the biggest financial challenge these days for millennials? I mean, mid twenties to mid thirties, what, what's their challenge? What are they struggling with? You know, student loan debt is definitely the biggest financial challenge, I think, in aggregate. But I also think, you know, there's a lot of macroeconomic factors out there. Like even though employment is good, wage growth is stagnant. The boomers are still jamming up the workplace for young adults. And so they, you know, are not having as many opportunities to promote and advance their careers as quickly as previous generations, which keeps that way wage growth stagnant. And, you know, lifestyle costs are higher. So like, you know, things that people would have done in the past, like buying a home or, you know, purchasing other things like it's just more of a challenge. And so when you combine all these factors, it, it really is just it's macroeconomics and it's, you know, individual personal financial choices that have made the financial picture for millennials more challenging than I think previous generations encountered. Now, my work mostly focuses on high income professionals like doctors. Are millennial doctors any different from other doctors in any significant material way? You know, I I think that, that, you know, it's hard to know, but, you know, because there's inflation and everything, but I think the cost of schooling is definitely higher. And so the student loan debt's higher, you know, just like other career paths, like I think wages are getting, you know, limiting. I think it definitely depends on your specialty, right? And you know this much more than I do, but you go into pediatrics or other specialties where there is a demand for doctors in many areas, the wages aren't there. And then on the flip side, you go into more advanced specialties and there's there's still great wages, but you know, you're tacking on another six years of training or something that's just going to add to your costs. So, you know, it's it's not necessarily any different than going into other professions. I think the income potentials there, the ROI on your education spending can still be there, but you just have to just be mindful across the board. So are you planning to keep focusing on millennials as millennials age with your writing and your blog, or are you going to stay focused on, on younger folks and in turn, it's going to become focused on generation Z and et cetera. I mean, I'm going to continue just driving home the message that we are about getting out of student loan debt and starting to invest, whether it's millennials or not, you know, that that's kind of my goal is navigating the complex world of student loan debt so that you can build wealth as early as possible. And, you know, sadly, early as possible might be their 30s or 40s, but hopefully we can knock them and tap into them when they're in their late teens, early 20s to set them up for success. Yeah. Well, let's turn now a little bit toward your blog and your site. I noticed looking through it in preparation for this that you're apparently trademarking a couple of terms, America's millennial money expert and America's student loan debt expert. 
And uh, I, I know I've had enough hassle and expense defending the white coat investor as, as a trademark and can't imagine defending those two terms. Why did you decide to trademark those and, and how's that gone for you? So I honestly decided to trademark them because I was thought they were cool. Like there really was no material business aspect to it, except how could I spend, you know, 700 bucks to, you know, have it. But I actually have leveraged it in many ways that have earned back that ROI. Now, defending them is probably something different. Luckily, I haven't, you know, encountered it because, you know, you see a lot of people call themselves a millennial money expert, but no one actually or a student loan debt expert. But you tack on America's and that's where you get the more of the defense aspect of it. But, you know, I don't even know if I would pursue it a ton. I probably would uh, just cursory to, to keep the trademarks there. But I leverage it a lot when it comes to our brand partnerships. And uh, some of the brands really do like that. And for a while there, I thought I was going to do more spokesperson work and be more public facing of my brand. And that's where these terms I was really going to start leveraging more. But, you know, I've pivoted over the years, but they're still pretty fun to have. Now, let's talk a little bit about your business a bit. I mean, you have grown this enough that it was making enough money for you to be able to quit your job. You've now got seven people working for you. What's it like to be a boss? Do you like it or dislike it? Oh, and see, I very much dislike being a boss. So I do have seven team members, I mean, but they're all freelancers. It's all virtual. One of the things that I grew up with at Target, right? So when I was a store manager, I had over 200 people reporting to me, various different pay levels and structures. And I enjoyed that. And that was like that season of life. But once I left... I really am a firm believer, especially in the online world of a company of one. So there's a new book out for it. I was always saying a business of one and, you know, there's a new book out called a company of one, but we live in this day and age where it's like, I don't necessarily see this reason to scale up a team. And actually I see more horror stories of online companies that like scaled up with big teams and then, you know, an algorithm changes and they're laying off all these people. Like, that sounds not appealing at all. So yes, we do have freelancers. Those seven people are all outsourced team members, but I keep it lean. I, uh, you know, keep it virtual. We run everything online on email, you know, no set hard, like, you know, ass in seat kind of things where you have to be at any certain time. That's what I really love about an online business is the, that virtual aspect, that company of one aspect where I, you know, pivoting out of that corporate quote unquote world into this online entrepreneurship world. I, I value my time. I, I don't have as much of a set schedule. Uh, I, you know, family comes first and I want that for the freelancers that work for me. And, you know, I, I, I really enjoy that. How much time do you think you're putting in these days into, into work? I put probably about 20 to 30 hours a week in and, you know, it definitely varies. There's some longer days like, you know, today's probably going to be like a six, seven hour days. And then there's days that maybe goes in and just check email for an hour or so. And, Go from there. I mean, what can people expect when they go to your website? What, I mean, are you publishing something every day? How many articles a month typically come out? I mean, what, what should they expect when they go there? Yeah, so we publish uh, every day. Well, Monday through Friday. Sometimes I do it on the weekends, but pretty much Monday through Friday, we have a new article. You know, we have a lot of reviews. So one of the things that I've always been passionate about is, you know, the new up and coming companies and financial technology companies. So that's one thing that we become known for is we do review pretty much every product, service, software that's out there in the personal finance space. So we do a lot of reviews. And then, you know, we, we definitely have our, um, you know, personal finance basics and interesting articles around different topics around student loan debt. You'll probably find everything you could ever want to know about student loan debt on our site. And then we do have a lot of investing content as well. So how do you balance the, this is a tricky thing I think anybody that's an online entrepreneur runs into. How do you balance writing about stuff your readers need to know about and writing posts that actually make money? Yeah, so it's tough. And, you know, I've been doing this a while and I still don't have 100% the answer. But one thing that I know is that I like to write the stuff that my readers need to know about. And I outsource the posts that I don't want to write that make money, like the reviews and different things. But on the flip side, people do want to know that stuff. It's just not necessarily what I want them to know about. And so it is about striking the balance. But the one thing I have learned is that if you're going to write about something, cover all the basics. So let's say that you want to dive into to the student loan space. Well, you know, what are you going to talk about there? Student loan forgiveness. Well, then there's 80 plus different programs and you should probably start covering all of those. And people want to know about all of them. And you've got to like build this ecosystem around your content. And some of it, not everyone's going to want to know about, 
But, you know, if you could help that one person, then it, it might be worth it. And I will say, like, I've written some very obscure stuff. And some of my most obscure content is also what has gotten some of the most exposure. I wrote an article, I don't know, probably like five, six years ago about pay ahead status and public service loan forgiveness. And how if you go into pay ahead status, you can disqualify yourself from public service loan forgiveness because it lowers your next future monthly payment. And I wrote this because a reader had this problem and uh, I researched it and, and wrote about it. And then nothing happened. I think over the course of two years, maybe a thousand people viewed the article, which is, is very low on our site. But then Ron Lieber from the New York Times reached out and was like, Robert, why the heck did you write this? Like, we're doing an in-depth piece on this and we have the same thing. We're finding readers have it. And we've been investigating Fed loan about this and their whole investigative journalism kind of, of money picked up our article and picked up our story and shared that out there. So like, you know, I think karma is always a good thing. You help people, you create content that's worthwhile and, you know, you'll get paid dividends from it in some way or another down the road. Now, you also put in a forum on your site. What's that been like? You know, I created the forum solely to create a place where people can ask questions in their own words. So the hard part with personal finance and doing this for so long is that I speak in different language probably than most readers speak. And so I wanted a place where they could post a question using their own language and then be able to answer those. And, you know, most of our forum responses redirect them to the appropriate article on our site. And uh, we don't get a ton of engagement, but we do answer people's questions. So I would say, you know, we get one or two posts, you know, a week, nothing crazy, nothing like your forums, but it does serve as that answer for people in their own language, which I think is very valuable because, you know, people type in all kinds of crazy search terms because they don't know exactly what they're looking for. And I think the forums can help address that and help people find the answers that they are looking for. Now, thumbing through some of your content, I see an article you wrote recently on the best places to trade options. Do you think it's a good idea for your readers to be trading options? I don't. But on the flip side, I have had this realization over the last few years that I also cannot be my reader's mom. So like whether I agree or disagree, all I can do is tell them my thoughts on it. And then on the flip side, at least show them tools and resources so they might not get themselves in a lot of trouble. And the one thing I also think is that a young adult, let's just say you're in your 20s and you know you're trading on, you know, you're not probably not spending your life savings trading options. You probably have $500, $1,000 and you're going to trade options on it. And if you lose it all, well, that's terrible. But on the flip side, it's a it's a cheap lesson learned for the future, hopefully. So that's my goal with this. I talk a lot about trading options is one. I talk about paying for advice and paying for help. Like people are going to do it whether I agree or disagree. So my goal is to at least show them the right way to go about it, give them the insight of you know what it is, and then at least provide reputable tools that uh, they won't get scammed out of their money or other things in that regard. Now let's talk a little bit about the subject of this podcast, paying for college. You had a fantastic article that you called the order of operations for paying for college. And it went through nine things that basically, nine ways to, to pay for college. And presumably you max out each of them before moving on to the next step. It started with uh, number one, scholarships and grants. And then number two, your own savings as a student. Number three, your earnings as a student. Number four, your parents' savings for college. Number five, your parents' current income. Number six, fellowships and assistantships. Number seven, aid through school work-related programs. Number eight, federal student loans. And number nine, private student loans. I think it's a great list, and I totally agree with it. Why did you feel like that article needed to be written? Well, the article needed to be written because so many people, especially in mainstream media, I guess you could say, just default to, you got to use student loans to pay for college. And it's like student loans are one option to pay for college, but there are so many things that people forget are actual other options and usually more, you know, better ways, I guess you could say, to pay for college. And I just really wanted to like demystify that, like, look, there is a, a good way to pay for college and you can maximize each of these buckets. And number one is scholarships, which are the totally number one most underrated way to pay for college. And it drives me nuts It's because no one just wants to put in the work to get the scholarship. But the scholarship is like the easiest 
best way to get free money to pay for school. Like, let me give you an example. So I run a scholarship on my website. It's live right now. It's called the Side Hustling Student Scholarship. And I wanted to reward entrepreneurial high school students. I want them to share their story. And then I'll give them a $2,500 scholarship. And I've been doing this for three years. So the crazy thing is, is it's $2,500 and there's a second place prize for $500. I only got 100 or so entries to that scholarship. And then once I started combing through it, 70 out of the 100 did not meet the criteria for the scholarship. And it's stupid things. It is like they didn't put a picture. I asked for a headshot. They didn't put the school they were going to. You know, they didn't format their essay. Some people like put them as a Google document, but they don't allow you to have the permissions to access that Google document. So here you are. There's a $2,500 scholarship. And really, you're in competition with 30 other people. Like the odds are so good. And that's what's so crazy is when I talk to other people that have run scholarships, it's very similar across the board. Like 70 to 80 percent of all scholarship applications get disqualified just for not meeting the basic criteria. And then it's just it's a numbers game, right? So you just do the expected value of the scholarship and your competition and then how many you apply to. You know, if you want to put the work in as a high school junior and high school senior, I would say if you applied to 50 to 60 scholarships, you could easily pay for 50 to 75% of your college career education costs, you know, and it's just crazy to me. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely an issue. And I've run into similar issues with our scholarship. We had one person within the last few years where the scholarship was clearly, or their application was clearly going to be a winning application. But we have a strict word limit on their essays. It's 800 to 1,200 words. And for their lack of ability to count to 1,200, they lost out on tens of thousands of dollars. So it's it's pretty amazing. Just crazy to me. Yeah. And so like, and that's what I just want people to realize is that paying for college isn't all about student loans. There's so many ways to do it. And, you know, you can save as a student. You can you can work through college. Your parents can save. You can get, you know, fellowships. And then, yeah, federal student loans should always be first for the most part and then private student loans. And, and of course, you know, this order of operations probably only applies to 90 percent of people. There's always going to be some random case out there where it's like, well, I should do this or I should do this. And it's like, yes. But for the most people, like you should really think about this order, especially for if you're a parent, you should tell your young high schooler, you know, even late middle schooler that, you know, this is what we have. This is what we expect. Like have these conversations so that by the time they're in their junior year of high school, it's not a surprise. They know what it's going to take and they can plan accordingly. Now, if you listen to Dave Ramsey and, you know, honestly, I probably agree with him. He would say that nobody needs to borrow for an undergraduate education. He, he'd probably extend that even to graduate school. I wouldn't quite go that far. I don't think anybody's going to work their way through dental school. But, you know, that's kind of how he believes it, that if you pick the school right, you pick one with a reasonable amount of tuition, you bust your butt, and maybe your parents help you some, that you can get through without debt. Do you think that's fair? Do you think that can be done? Do you think most people should be getting through their undergraduate education without borrowing? Absolutely. I think if you look at the stats, you know, about 40 percent of people graduate college today even with no student loan debt. So like 40 percent of America is already doing it and 60 percent aren't. That number continues to be less and less people over time, but it's totally doable. I think my big thing with student loans is figuring out the return on investment of your education dollars. I don't necessarily think borrowing is bad, but we're Everyone gets into trouble with it, and it's no different than borrowing for a house or borrowing for a car. It's they borrowed too much and they couldn't afford it. And so, you know, if you want to be a teacher today in America, that's great. But, you know, realize your starting salary, depending on where you teach, could be in the low 30,000s to maybe like 45, 50,000 if you're on, you know, New York or California. And so, if you're going to earn that after graduation, that's fine. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but don't go spend $80,000 to become a teacher. Maybe you go to your local community college, which in a lot of states now, they're making it free. And even if it's not free in your state, it's very cost effective. Do that for two years. Knock out all your undergraduate stuff. Then you transfer to your local in-state school. You finish up your two years and you could be done and get a teaching credential for ten, twenty thousand dollars 
Now, when you're looking at your starting salary as a teacher, you know, you can afford to service that debt on your starting salary. It might not necessarily be the easiest, but it's definitely a lot better than spending eighty, ninety thousand dollars to be a teacher. And then when you combine that with scholarships, when you combine that with potentially working through school and all these other ways that we talk about on the order to save, you can even minimize your debt further. So Dave's not wrong. But on the flip side, you know, thinking about the return on investment of your dollars, you know, a little debt here can be a positive return for you. It's just when you spend way too much that it becomes negative. So what what rule of thumb can people follow? How do they know when they spend too much? My rule of thumb is never borrow more than you expect to earn in your first year after graduation. And so like if you want to be a teacher, you're going to make $40,000. You should never borrow more than $40,000. You know, if you're going to go be a doctor, it's the same rule applies. Like if you're going to go be a pediatrician, you expect to make 150,000, well, you should probably keep your borrowing to about 150,000. You're going to go be an orthopedic surgeon, you're going to make, you know, $600,000 a year, well you can definitely afford to borrow a lot more. But, you know, it definitely varies based on what you want to do after graduation and, and you have to be intentional with that spending. But on the flip side, that's hard to tell a 17 year old, 18 year old kid when they're making these decisions. So it definitely needs to have a lot of parental involvement in it. Right. So, I mean, what about the person that, uh, you know, this is my dream. I want to be a pediatrician and my family can't help me at all. And I don't think I can get the grades I need to get into medical school if I'm working. And so my only option is to borrow $600,000 to get this job that pays 150 or 200. What do you say to that person that, that feels like you're killing their dream by giving them advice like that? My, I say like on the flip side, though, is your dream to struggle financially for the next 40 years of your life. So like it might be your dream to help people, but maybe you could go be uh, R, you know, start with it, be an LPN and then be an RN and then, you know, do it for a lot less and still help people because if you're going to be a pediatrician, like I don't want to dismiss pediatricians, but you're treating colds and ear infections and you're referring them out to specialties. You know, that's why they don't earn very much. So could you get your same fulfillment without jeopardizing your future 40 years of your life trying to pay back this debt? You could also look at navigating the variety of programs that are out there to help you. So, you know, if you really do your due diligence, you take out federal loans, you go work in a public clinic and you get public service loan forgiveness, well, maybe it's worth it. Or you could take advantage of one of the many rural opportunity programs. So like, you know, every state has some kind of program out there where you could go be a doctor or a nurse in like a, you know, remote location and they'll basically forgive your loans or put a portion of your, you know, pay a portion of your loans over time. Like there's a lot of programs out there for that. But once again, you have to do that work up front. And you have to commit yourself to that, whether it is like doctors already are putting themselves and they're committing themselves to eight, 10 years of education. So you got to ask yourself, is it worth the commitment for another 10 years beyond that potentially or more to, you know, achieve this dream of mine? And it's either going to be working in an area you might not want to work in or it's going to be struggling financially because you took on too much debt you can't afford to pay. The, the, the courses can be laid out and you can do, you know, you can analyze all your options, but you just need to do that up front versus when it's too late. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with that, that you ought to look at it and analyze it up front. Now, for those 4,000 pediatricians that are utterly mad right now, send all your hate mail to Robert, not to me. All right? Please do. I know you guys are doing lots more than cold, so send him you, your let, hate mail. Let me know because <laughs> so my, my sister is uh, starting her, you know, training right now and she wants to be a pediatrician. And so uh, I've had these conversations. Send me your love and hate and advice for her. You can send it to me, of course. Don't blame Jim. It's all Robert <laughs> yeah. here. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, the first first part of your answer to the last question is going to get you some emails. So here uh, we go. That's all right. I'm, I'm all for it. You know, because there's, once again, it's definitely the good and the bad. You know, people do have their goals, but, you know, finances play such a huge part of your life. And you have to do the expected value of it. And not to say that it's not worth it or whatnot. And, but, you know, that's just the math. Yeah, you don't get a pass on math. You, you don't. Just because you want to be a doctor. That's right. absolutely right. Okay, so why do people struggle so much with student loans? Are they just ignorant and undisciplined? Is the system unfair or is it some combination of both? It's definitely ignorance and the system. So one is we're expecting these 18-year-old, 19-year-old kids to make very 
important financial decisions with very little to no guidance or education. I remember when I got my student loans, I remember I got an email from the financial aid office. This was like May or June before my freshman year. And it said, congratulations, you've received financial aid, right? So notice they don't call them student loans. They say, congratulations, you have a financial aid award. And then I clicked the link in the email, took me to the financial aid website. And it said like, click here to accept your award. You know, you have a little checkbox and that checkbox is next to a student loan, but they're calling it a financial aid award and financial aid award. And then you, you scroll through some terms and conditions, which at this point in our lives, we've all been trained to just skip to the bottom of the terms and conditions and hit accept. And that's how I got my student loans. It is crazy how easy it is. And there is no education and no anything to go around it. So that's part of it. But on the flip side, did you know, Jim, there's over 150 different options for your student loan debt when you're said and done. I'm talking about student loan forgiveness, repayment plans, deferment options. Like when you literally take all the different paths that someone can take with their loan type and their career and their repayment plan, there's 150 plus different variables. And so that's just hard to navigate as well. And yes, most people are going to default into like one of four different major ones. But that's not to say that, you know, option number 121 isn't the best one for you. And so it's very challenging to navigate repayment. And then when you combine that with the fact that these loan servicers are call centers with, you know, 10,000 plus employees that, you know, are making minimum wage, they're probably not necessarily doling out, you know, the personal financial advice you need, right? They're just trying to answer. Your that, that's a nice way to put it. I usually say utterly incompetent. But. Well, you know, <laughs> is it incompetence or is it, you know, I'm, I'm making $10 an hour in the call center. And then on the flip side, you have to say, does the caller that's calling Fed loan or whatever company they're calling, are they saying the right things to the to the representative that the representative even knows what they're talking about because so many people are just ignorant of the terms to use. Like when you're calling and saying, I need to lower my student loan payment. Well, are you asking for an income driven repayment plan or are you asking for the extended plan or do you need a deferment or do you need, are you looking for loan forgiveness options? Like I'm a call center rep. I don't know your financial situation. I don't care about your financial situation. I'm getting paid $10 an hour to answer this call. And so if you also aren't clear about what you're asking for, it's very difficult for a call center representative to help you. So the whole system is very challenging. And the best thing you can do is just educate yourself because, I mean, you know the rule. No one in this world is going to care more about your money than you. And so, you know, if you don't care about it, it you know, it's going to be challenging. Yeah. So what are the biggest student loan related mistakes you're seeing your readers make in these days? The biggest one I see is that people are not doing their research when it comes to what qualifies for these loan forgiveness plans, what repayment plans they should be on. They are just defaulting into, you know, let's just say you're done with college, right? You get six months of deferment on your federal loans, and then you automatically go into the standard 10-year plan if, if you don't elect a choice, right? Well, they see that first bill, and they're like, I can't afford it. Well, then they default, and then that drags on, their loans grow, and it becomes a mess, and, you know, they're not sorting it out until it's too late. And then I see the headlines, right? Like 99% of people are denied for public service loan forgiveness. I'm sure most of your listeners have seen that headline. Well, that headline could not be more misleading about the effectiveness of public service loan forgiveness and like what it actually takes to qualify. So the fact that people think that they would qualify for public service loan forgiveness in month one that the program started is so wrong. And it's not, you know, the government's fault that people didn't educate themselves on how the program worked. And then, you know, when you look at the denial reasons, the number one most common reason that you're getting denied is because you didn't fill out the application correctly. It's like 33% of all of them didn't fill out the application correctly or left a blank or, you know, whatnot. So it's like, of course, the government's going to deny you. It's just like your scholarship winner. They went over the word count. They got knocked out of the running for it, right? Like, follow the directions, people. I don't know. So those are the most common things I see is not taking action and then just not doing your diligence around your own things. So what is your opinion on the current status of public service loan forgiveness? I mean, certainly there's issues with people not understanding how the program works. Certainly there are competence issues on the part of those running the program. I mean, it takes a year and a half to get a recount of the payments you've made. Right. I mean, do you think that this is going to be around for a long time? Do you think people should really be counting on it? Do you think this is a good program, a bad program? What, what are your thoughts on, on where we're at currently with public service loan forgiveness? 
Sure. I think it's a great program that is poorly structured. So like in my ideal world, so it, for those that don't know, direct student loans is the number one qualifying criteria. Number two is you have to be on a qualifying repayment plan, which is the other thing that I think is silly with this program. Like why be so strict? You have to be on a qualifying repayment plan. And then number three is you have to work in qualifying public service for 120 months, 120 payments. Right. And so if you look at the data, the program is actually doing exactly as expected, right? So here's some scary stats. In 2019 to 2021, there's only going to be 1,800 people this year and next year or so that are going to get public service loan forgiveness. That's just the math of who had the qualifying criteria 10 years ago. There just wasn't very many. But when you fast forward this clock to you out to 2025, they're going to have 150,000 people that are potentially eligible for public service loan forgiveness in 2025. And that starts to make sense because when the program started, you know what? Direct loans were only 1% to 3% of all student loans issued. So number one criteria doesn't get met. And then the other one, the correct repayment plan, most of the repayment plans didn't come about until 2009 to 2011. In 2007, when the program started, income contingent repayment was the only repayment plan that existed, right? And that was a really, it's still a really terrible plan. It's not really terrible, but it's not the best, right? And so it would have been so rare in 2007 for someone to have direct loans, for someone to be on income contingent repayment, and for them to follow the law so well that they recertify or they started certifying their employment immediately. So rare. But when you start thinking about 2015, 2016, the program had been around for a few years. Now you have direct loans. Everybody's getting direct loans after 2011. You start having, you know, pay as you earn was created. IBR was created. Repay was created. So these qualifying repayment plans were all created. People were graduating college. The program had existed. Now it's starting to make sense. 2015, 2016, 2017, you have big cohorts of borrowers that are potentially eligible for loan forgiveness. So the program is working exactly as it should. People just need to realize that it takes 10 years from this point in time. So 2022, 2023, we'll start seeing lots more people getting student loan forgiveness in the program. And that's why I also think it'll be around. So the, the numbers say it's going to come in the future. The biggest groups of lobbyists in America are public service employees. You're talking the teachers, the firefighters, you know, all the politicians are surrounded in their offices by people that are potentially eligible for public service. It would be very politically, I don't know, I don't think they'd be able to stomach it politically to eliminate the program. I think they should reform it. I think they should expand it, open it up fix some of these things. Even their fixes, like temporary expanded public service loan forgiveness is so poorly done. Like you have to apply, get denied, and then send an email to FedLoan. Like that's just totally incompetent, like that they would have even created a law like that. But, you know, they did. I think they need to, you know, definitely fix some of these gaps in there. But the program is working well. And I think we're going to start seeing a huge waves of people in the next two, three years start getting loan forgiveness. And then we'll start seeing a lot of positive chatter around it. Now, you know, some people say it's not fair. It's not fair that an academic orthopedic surgeon who really only made payments for four years because they made little tiny payments during the residency and fellowship should have four or $500,000 forgiven when they're making six or $700,000 a year. What do you say to those who, who criticize that aspect of the program for high income professionals? Totally. I mean, there's always going to be a moral hazard with everything. I mean, you know, there's always going to be those one or two people that take advantage, whether you call it taking advantage or not, it's what the law is. But on the flip side, one of the reasons I really like public service loan forgiveness is that it requires 10 years or, or 120 payments of giving back in what we deem as public good, right? Public service jobs are typically in the public good, right? So you're not getting something for nothing. We are asking these people to commit to working in the public good for a period of 10 years. And, you know, these programs have always existed in different forms or fashions, even before public service loan forgiveness. The military is a prime example. They've been doing this for 20, 30 years, where you go and serve in the military for five years and they'll give you $50,000 to pay off your loan. You know, and so it's really a question like, 
if you disagree with the fact that we're talking about public service loan forgiveness and that it exists, well, your beef shouldn't be with that orthopedic surgeon. Your beef should be with your legislators and your congressmen. The, the program exists. You know, if you don't like it, channel your efforts towards people that, you know, can create the laws and change the laws, not the person that is taking advantage of a perfectly legal program. Now, some people say, well, this wasn't designed for doctors. This was designed for firefighters and teachers. And in fact, the Obama budget, I think it was in 2013, had a recommendation to limit the amount you could have forgiven to just $57,000 a year, which obviously makes this a non-starter for most docs to, to use the program. What's your opinion of a change like that? Would it be a good change, a bad change to the program? And what do you think the likelihood of something like that happening is? You know, I, I can see something like that happening, but I think it would have to go hand in hand with a lot of other reforms. One of my big beefs and one of my actual proponents is I am a big believer that you should cap the amount of student loans that you can take out, especially grad plus loans, which I know a lot of docs take advantage of because the fact that you can borrow unlimited amounts of money for grad school is part of the price inflation of grad school and of, you know, all these different universities. And on the flip side, that's where people get into trouble. So I would say if you're going to cap the amount of student loans that can be forgiven, well, you also need to cap the amount, both federal and private, that can be borrowed. And then you're going to see a massive change in the marketplace, which, you know, I, I can't tell you if it would be good and bad. There's definitely going to be pros and cons and arguments on both sides of that equation. But uh, I think they would have to go hand in hand together. I think in terms of public service loan forgiveness, doctors that work in public service are giving back. You know, like they're staffing VA hospitals, they're staffing, you know, nonprofit clinics and providing services that other people might not want to provide. You know, they're probably working in lower income areas, seeing, you know, different clientele than other practitioners. So or they're educators, right? And they're educating the next, you know, group of doctors that we need in this country. So on the flip side, they are doing public service. And I, I don't think we should dismiss that. Even though their loan balances are higher, they are specialty, specially trained and they have services and things that are valuable in our country. Now, I run into docs sometimes that say, man, I'm just having a lot of trouble paying off my $200,000 in student loans on my income of $200,000. Well, what do you say to those people? Do you think that's ridiculous? Or or what's your response to, to docs who are, who are taking... Years and years and years to pay off their student loans with ratios like that. Yeah, I, I think it's it's challenging. I mean, every situation is so unique, and it's it's no different than someone that's struggling to pay off thirty thousand dollars in student loan debt. Is you know, there's income based repayment plans, right? So if you're already on that, your payments cap 10, 15 percent of your discretionary income, and if you're still struggling at that point in time, you got to look at the rest of your budget. Like, you know, I also see, and, and you talk about this a lot on your site, is like, you know, these doctors that make, you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year and, and have no wealth actually, right? They have a high income, but they're not building any kind of wealth because they're spending all their money. They have a, a second vacation home, they have a boat, they have an RV, like all these things. You don't need those, right? Like you shouldn't be blowing your money. You actually had an anonymous question in your forum the other day that I, I really loved it. And in the private Facebook group for the, your white co-investors. And it was this guy that had this payment mentality, right? Like he owed his parents money still. And he had uh, all these payments and he was paying on like three cars and all this stuff. Is, you know, the biggest driver of wealth is getting out of the payment mentality. And so you can service your loan payment or you can just pay off your loans. And once you start getting out of the payment mentality, well, I can nurse along a payment here and I can nurse along a payment there. You'll start building wealth and you'll start seeing your whole financial outlook change. And I think that's the biggest thing is that doctors start getting this great income, but then they start filling in the, the gap between their mandatory expenses and like, you know, what they're earning with fun stuff and other stuff. And, you know, that just wastes all their money. Yeah. Now we're starting to push up against an hour here on this podcast, so we better start wrapping it up here. But I wanted to give you the chance, if there's anything else you'd like the twenty to 30,000 docs and other high-income professionals that will eventually listen to this podcast to know, what, what would you like to tell them? If you've got their ear here just for a minute or two, what's the most important thing you think you could tell them at this point? Yeah, honestly, as you are navigating that student loan repayment, like it's really important to get organized and know your options and make the plan and stick to the plan. You've already been a doctor. You, you know how to commit to something. You went through a lot of schooling, and a lot of training, more than 
anybody else in this country, right? So it's like you are totally capable of committing to the plan and then sticking to that for the five to 10 years that it's going to take to eliminate your student loan debt. But it can be confusing. One of the things that, uh, you know, we've been doing is creating a tool called Loan Buddy to help navigate that. Jim, I've shared a little bit with him, but like there's tools out there, there's services, there's Jim's blog here, the White Coat Investor is phenomenal. So many great resources, the forum there, like get educated, know exactly what you need to do, dot your I's, cross your T's on these forms and you know, it can be done. You can get out of, don't, you can get out of student loan debt very quickly and easily, but you just have to be very diligent about it. Thank you so much, Robert. So we've been talking with Robert Farrington, the founder of thecollegeinvestor.com, where he provides lots of information for young investors, for indebted people with student loans, uh, millennials in particular. And he's been uh, doing that since 2009. So a very successful online entrepreneur. Thank you so much, Robert, for coming on our show. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Okay. I hope that was helpful talking about that with Robert Farrington. It's interesting to kind of get it from the perspective of an average Joe. You know, so often we talk about this stuff in terms of doctor incomes and doctor debt loads. And, and sometimes we forget there's lots of people out there struggling with a, an income of $50,000 a year and student loans of $80,000 a year, which obviously takes a lot more sacrifice to pay off than it does for, for a lot of us with physician-sized loans and incomes. This episode was sponsored by Set for Life Insurance. Set for Life is first and foremost a client-centric company. They listen carefully to the needs of clients because of the volume and exceptional reputation of Set for Life Insurance, as well as the relationships they have developed over the years. Set for Life clients have access to special services not available elsewhere in the industry. This includes special discounts, gender-neutral policies, saving women significantly, priority underwriting handling, and on some occasions, exceptions in the underwriting process. For more information, visit setforlifeinsurance.com. All right. So make sure you get your scholarship applications in. If you'd like to help us judge the scholarship, it's not that hard. Yes, it doesn't pay anything. You get no recognition for it, but you'll only have to read some routine 10 and 20 of these essays and you'll have real impact on the choice of who wins these scholarship dollars and, uh, and which medical schools actually end up getting these books from for their medical students. So make sure you get your scholarship applications in by the 31st. If you'd like to be a judge, again, email us at scholarship at whitecoatinvestor.com. Put volunteer judge in the title and we'll get you in there to do that. Basically, the only criteria is you can't be a student or a resident. You have to be a professional working in your profession or a retiree and we'll let you be a judge. So we could use as much help as we can get with that. We're going to have hundreds and hundreds of applications this year. Head up, shoulders back. You've got this. We can help. We'll see you next time on the White Coat Investor Podcast. My dad, your host, Dr. Dahl, is a practicing emergency physician, blogger, author, and podcaster. He is not a licensed accountant, attorney, or financial advisor. So this podcast is for your entertainment and information only and should not be considered official, personalized financial advice.